I am so thrilled to be here today uh, with Bernard Tan, who is the CEO of RE Royalties. Uh, hi, Bernard. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tim, and thank you uh, for having me on your show. I'm really glad uh, to be here today. Yeah, I'm so thrilled for you to join us. Um, I, I saw your product, and uh, uh, really, to me, this is an exciting thing for sustainable investors. I know there's a huge amount of appetite for green bonds, uh, uh, social impact bonds, all these types of impact bonds. And I think what you're offering here is a little bit different from what I've seen before, uh, just in the fact that you are sort of a publicly traded company. Company, um, offering a green bond. So really just wanted to have you here just to be able to, to dig into the product, learn a little bit more about you, learn a little bit more about uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, RE royalties, and, and really just see whether, give people information, uh, help them decide for themselves whether this might be a nice addition to their portfolio. So before we kind of get into the, the product and the bond and all that fun stuff, really wanted to, to learn a little bit more about you because you've got kind of an interesting <laughs> history. Uh, you yeah. started your career largely in the mining industry, is my understanding. Um, yeah. And that helped me understand that it must have been a real shift for you, you know, career-wise, psychologically, you know, towards this renewable energy space. And I would just love to sort of hear your journey there. Uh, yeah, I'd love to share that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I caught the renewable energy bug a number of years ago. Uh, as you said, uh, I spent about 10 years uh, in the mining industry as a CFO uh, for a number of sort of uh, a, a private equity group there, uh, basically honing my skills. I'm a, a CPA by trade, so numbers and finances were sort of my bread and butter uh, start of my career at KPMG. Uh, but really, I would say that that pivoting point for me uh, at sort of a personal and professional level uh, came uh, a number of years ago um, uh, when uh, I became a new parent. Mm. Um, as uh, most new parents know, it is uh, life changing uh, to have a child. And for me, it was definitely uh, more ways than one uh, in the sense that um, uh, when, you know, I sort of became a new parent, uh, my, my uh, thought process uh, changed quite dramatically in the sense that I was really, I started looking at things through their eyes uh, yeah. and what their, uh, you know, the future generation uh, would look like. And really what really scared me at that point was, was climate change because uh, we could see all these changes happening, you know, year over year more frequent forest fires, more, um, you know, hazardous storms, more frequency. And when I started looking at it from their perspective and the, um, you know, the years that they would grow up in, it really worried me. And I, it sort of compelled me to want to do something. Um, you know, obviously at that, at that time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. <laughs> but yeah. I knew, you know, being a, an accountant, I, I knew, you know, about numbers, I knew about finances, but not much else. Yeah, and, so, I mean, and there are some real similarities between mining projects and how they're financed and how they're structured, right? Yep. In that it's an initial investment with this payout that's going to happen over time. And so, you know, must have, you know, been a very easy transition for you career wise, really being able to shift to a system where, you know, now it's the same thing, you know, capital up front, you've got to build a project, pay for everything up front, and then get those returns over, a, you know, 15, 20, you know, in some cases, 40 year life of a project. Yeah, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, there's a lot of similarities, um, you know, with, say, take an example, a solar project, they're typically uh, out in remote or semi remote areas, uh, lots of right. capital required. And my experience in the mining sector um, introduced myself to royalty financing. So what is royalty financing? Um, I would say royalty financing is actually a very Canadian concept uh, in the sense that if you look at capital markets uh, throughout the world, uh, there are more royalty companies uh, in Canada compared to you know, the, the UK, the US yeah. or, or Asia. Uh, take very, you know, established companies like Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, Prairie uh, Sky, uh, which is in oil and gas. Even if you go yeah. to a restaurant like Keg or, you know, have your oil change done at Mr. Lube, 
uh, those fundamentally are um, royalty companies. So I would say that um, from a Canadian marketplace standpoint, royalty companies are uh, very dominant in everywhere you look today, even if you, you know, look at, uh, go get a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. Yeah. Uh, a royalty is actually paid to um, uh, RBI, the restaurant. The, the parent company. Yeah. Yes, the parent and, company. and this is a model that, like you said, Canadian investors know well. I mean, I think that we have such history in the natural resource sector in mining, in oil and gas, have been such a leader for companies listing on the Toronto Stock Exchange. To me, it's just the parallel there just means that that we do have such amazing opportunity here in Canada with our knowledge, with our experience. And I love the fact that your skill set was able to translate so well, so smoothly from mining into renewable energy. Because I think that that is, you know, a microcosm of the, the larger transition yeah. that we need to happen here in Canada. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, to understand a little bit so that, you know, you are a fairly small company. Uh, you do trade on the venture exchange. So for a lot of my viewers, they'd be familiar with the Toronto Stock Exchange and the sort of TSX. And this would be the TSX venture exchange, um, which suggests that, you know, you, you are early on in your development. And I'm just curious, a lot of the renewable energy companies that have used this model that I've seen have kind of remained private. You know, in my experience, that seems to be sort of the, the dominant setting. So I just love to hear your rationale for why you did decide to go public, you know, maybe a little bit earlier than some of the other companies in the space. Yeah. So a lot of that, uh, when we first started off the company and, you know, we were pitching the, the, the concept to some of our early stage investors, uh, one of the things we told them was after two years, uh, so we started in 2016. And we told them within two years, two to three years, we would look at taking the company public. Part of that is to increase that level of exposure. Uh, we've had a lot of people, um, you know, ask, you know, when we tell them what we do, the, one of the first questions is, you know, how do I involve myself? How do I uh, participate? And um, so the decision to go public actually was made very early on. Um, that we told our early stage investors that, you know, it is uh, an avenue. They continue to be shareholders and investors today. So we did take the company public in 2018. Uh, it was a promise that we made and a promise that we kept uh, for them. Uh, and then new investors came in during our IPO. And what we told them at that time as well is that, you know, within two to three years, what we would look at uh, potentially doing is actually a green bond offering, which is um, you know what we are currently doing today. So again, it allows different types of investors to participate uh, in different structures of the company. If they like the equity, uh, they can buy the equity. If they like a more fixed income uh, vehicle, they can buy the the bonds. So uh, again, for us, the the um, the whole aspect of making sure that we deliver on our promises um, um, is, is absolutely critical for us and as a management team, as a board, uh, to ensure that um, uh, that's, that's available uh, to all our investors. Amazing, because it really does make it so accessible that really because it's publicly traded, anyone can just go in and, and buy it. And I've just got your little chart up here on Yahoo Finance, um, just so that people can see the market cap, about 41 million. So this is very much on the sort of smaller side of a lot of the the uh, 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 companies that, that I've looked at. And that, you know, you're trading at a, a $1.30 right now. And I mean, really what this means is that it's a very, very low barrier to entry. That really, you know, people that do want to buy the shares um, are able to buy in for as little as like, you know, a uh, dollar thirty. That that you are able to um, uh, uh, really make this very accessible. Um, so, Aaron, I see your question here. That's an awesome question. I'm going to get there. Uh, bear with me for a moment, um, uh, Bernard. I do want to come back to you and just ask you about, you know, different technologies that we're seeing a lot of these different renewable technologies. Uh, you know, solar, wind, everything. You do have a fairly diversified portfolio across a few of them, but really curious in terms of like the next moves, is there any technology that you really like right now that, that you're sort of more excited about than the others? Uh, I, I would say we are quite agnostic uh, to the types of technologies. I think uh, part of what we try to do uh, and finance the projects, um, you know, definitely uh, there's a lot of competing technologies. 
and they're all great in their own sense, uh, but we tend to be agnostic. Uh, part of that reason is, as well as uh, from a climate change approach, I think it's one of the all hands on deck uh, approach where you really need not just solar, but wind and hydro, uh, energy efficiency to be able to solve some of those um, uh, challenges. Uh, historically, however, we have been focused primarily on, on wind and solar, and part of that is really a function of the uh, incredible growth uh, in terms of deployment of those technologies, but also the efficiency in those technologies. Yeah. Um, one of the things I saw uh, recently uh, was a Bloomberg study that basically said that uh, two-thirds uh, of the world currently as it stands, uh, the cheapest form of energy is solar and wind. And this is without any subsidies, it's just the pure efficiency um, and thus the improvements that these technologies have really uh, come around in the last few years. Yeah, they've gotten so much cheaper. It's really amazing watching that cost curve and uh, you know, really excited there. Um, as well, you know, curious from a geographic standpoint, you know, a lot of these things are cost competitive, but hey, like if there are subsidies, you know, it doesn't hurt, certainly makes it more competitive. You know, in terms of jurisdictional preferences, are there any areas that where you do see growth opportunities? Uh, I would say it's, it's really global. Uh, again, we're agnostic globally uh, in terms of uh, where we see projects. However, our investment mandate currently only uh, is around OECD um, uh, type countries. And we do have a press preference for North America, Europe, um, you know, places like Japan and Australia, where right. uh, the um, uh, regulations surrounding sort of renewables are very uh, established. So we generally yeah. like those areas. Again, really, it's more from a risk assessment sort of standpoint. But for now, it's OECD only, and that that makes sense. And that you know, and I think I think part of it as well is just so that people really understand your business model. And I think Aaron, this will kind of get to your question about the difference between co-power and RE royalties a little bit is that you know you're not developing these projects you're not building them you're not doing anything this is like a pure sort of financing play where because it's a royalty you know you're not necessarily even like going in and signing the contracts with the governments like really you're partnering with my understanding is is you know very large utilities um, and the, they're the ones building the projects and going through that. What you're doing is essentially purchasing up front, you know, a small little share of that cash flow, such that your cash flow, your the sort of predictability and everything is is you know should be a lot uh, uh, um, a lot more consistent, I would think, in terms of those expected cash flows. And that really, you know, the difference between something like co-power and RE royalties, or one of the differences anyway, is that co-power is going out there and really, I think, sourcing those deals and, and creating them and signing those contracts individually. Whereas, you know, my understanding is that your play is much more partnering with the larger institutions that have all the lawyers and all the, you know, engineers and all that stuff. Yeah. And then you're just kind of riding their coattails a little bit. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that's uh, 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 quite accurate. Uh, you know, again, we know the co-power team. Uh, they are an incredible and great team. And, you know, we, we like working with them. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a little bit different in the sense that because uh, a lot of our structures are royalty based, uh, we tend to sort of take a much longer view uh, in the sense that just again, to give you an example, uh, one of our clients, which we finance, um, have uh, royalties on projects that are operated by Northland Power uh, and Northland Power sells the power to Hydro One. So, that's an yep. example of where our royalties come from. So even though we finance, um, you know, a company that's relatively unknown, the operator of the project is Northland Power, which I think you uh, look up is uh, oh, yeah. a five billion dollar uh, company, very well established yeah. in Ontario. The payer is Hydro One, which is uh, to a certain degree the government uh, of Ontario. So those are the types of, uh, that's just an example of, you know, what actually funds the company and in terms of our revenue line. Uh, so we do sort of look through multiple layers to make Love sure it. that, um, you know, it, it is very credit worthy and it's very predictable and it's very stable. 
Great. And so, okay, so let's talk about the bond. Let's dig into it. We can, you know, get get to nuts and bolts here. And I want to be clear with people before this, we get into this, like, I have no skin in the game here. Uh, I'm not getting paid for this. This isn't a promotional thing at all. This is just me trying to inform the market about green bonds. Uh, really had the opportunity to, uh, uh, um, someone from your team reached out to see if, you know, there might be uh, an opportunity to, to collaborate um, as like a, an influencer or something like that. That's not my business model. <laughs> so, you know, really also want to be clear that this is not advice that really I think everyone needs to figure out their own situation. Um, and should be speaking to an expert to understand that really what we're doing is here is sort of discussing the general risks and merits of this opportunity. So by all means, uh, do your own homework, give it a lot of thought before you do uh, actually decide to invest any money. So, okay, so basically, uh, let me just bring up the uh, company website here because I think you've done a pretty good job of uh, uh, laying out the green bond. Um, so there is the share offering, like people can buy shares whenever they want, like that would be sort of wide open. What we're gonna talk about today is this green bonds uh, uh, available now. And that what we can see here is that uh, the bond does offer a 6% annual interest rate. Um, and it is locked in for a five year term. Um, so we will talk about those, those you know, sort of terms in a moment to understand that. Um, but really the key thing that I think is a little bit of a pain is that for the bond, there is a minimum investment of 5K um, and it, it's available, it's eligible for RSP, TFSA, et cetera. But actually getting it inside of those accounts is a little bit of a challenge. So I just want to bring that up sort of right off the bat that um, you do have agreements with a number of online brokers. So if someone like has an advisor, has a broker, has someone that they deal with, uh, they should be able to access this through like a traditional bond desk. Um, but since a lot of my clients are the do it yourself crowd, you know, my understanding is that this is available through a number of platforms, but it kind of varies platform by platform. Is that right? Yes, that it, it is correct. And each uh, platform does have uh, their own sort of unique aspects of it. Yeah, um, we are working with uh, IROC um, uh, broker uh, called Integral Wealth Securities. And they've also really helped uh, sort of uh, some of the uh, do it yourself uh, investors to navigate some of the paperwork with their self directed accounts. So you know, again, uh, if you are interested, not to worry, uh, we have um, a, a team that can able to guide you again. Um, you know, and if you have an advisor, uh, our um, uh, bro our uh, investment bankers can also work with uh, work with them. Advisors. Yeah, to make sure everything is all properly uh, tied up uh, and the suitability of the investments. Uh, oh, I do have to say because it. it is a yeah. fixed income; it's not liquid. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, please keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, it is a five-year term. It's locked in for five years. There, that's absolutely one of the big downsides here. And then, um, you know, and then just because so many of my clients are on the platform Questrade, mm -hmm. my understanding is that right now you've chatted with them. It's available, but I think they want it uh, 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 a twenty-five k minimum. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we haven't been onboarded uh, with Questrade yet. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously we uh, would love to be able to find a way to work with them. Uh, so for those investors uh, that obviously are using the Questrade platform, uh, be patient. Okay. <laughs> uh, the other alternative as well is obviously uh, there are other uh, online brokers typically um, you know, investors have different sort of brokerage accounts with different institutions and you can right. definitely sort of help facilitate that uh, if, if they choose and they really like it. Okay, great. Um, I think that, yeah, and, and I also think that investor pressure can work. So if the onboarding <laughs> hasn't happened at Questrade yet, you know, for all of us who, who that have accounts that want this, let's uh, get on that customer service queue and wait until we get someone and then we can bug them as clients to say, hey, let's get this available. Um, OK, cool. And so, you know, really when it comes to the, the, the risks and the downsides, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we did talk about the liquidity risk. Uh, which is the uh, uh, five-year term that we are locked in for five years. So obviously that's a huge consideration for investors. Uh, when it comes to the 6% interest rate, like this is pretty generous. Like this is higher than, you know, some of the green bonds that we've seen. Um, so, you know, really wanted to, to really understand 
uh, why you sort of set it at that rate. Hey, like I'm not complaining there, but yeah. you know, I did have a, a, have one client write in. Um, she wrote in ahead of time uh, saying that the percentage return seems very competitive, which almost indicates more risks to me. Would that be correct? And so, you know, really do want to talk to you about uh, uh, the risk profile of this bond. Um, yes. Before we do that, just want to get some clarity on the 6% interest rate. Like you do have other products that are structured like this is still a good deal for you, right? Like you're able to borrow money at 6% and invest it and earn a higher rate than that. Yes, and that and that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, again, for us, uh, we wanted to come up with a very strong footing uh, to again, uh, you know, be able to tell our story. We think six percent is an attractive rate. I know, uh, as uh, an investor, and I'm buying this for my RSPs as well. Uh, you know, it's a nice uh, return relative to say a five-year uh, GIC. Yeah. So in you know, it is uh, quite attractive from the, uh, the, the rate perspective, but I think also uh, what we've also done is to make sure that we've built uh, features into the bond itself that will provide, uh, you know, as much protection to the investors as possible. Uh, you know, you're absolutely correct in the sense that as a new company, uh, there's a perception that we have to address on, you know, how risky are we truly are. Sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you you're know, still early. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, what it's also important to, to understand a lot of investors are always going to go to this question of sort of is it rated by a credit rating agency? You know, and I think that, that my understanding is that that process is so expensive. We're talking tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that rating done. This isn't like a free service that yeah. these, <laughs> these groups do. So, yeah. you know, so I uh, want to be clear that this is not uh, 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 rated by a credit rating agency, correct? Yes, that's correct. I, I think our preference is to uh, take that cash and pay our investors. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, and you'll get there. There'll, there'll be a time of the economy of scale where that yeah. makes sense and where that's important. But I think that, that for now, I, I completely understand the decision to stay unrated, which is, you know, one of the reasons there. Um, and then, you know, what was really cool, though, is, is uh, 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 you know, hearing from you that this is secure debt, that I think it's really important for investors to understand the difference between unsecured debt, which is just like loaning money to anyone. There's really nothing backing the bond versus secured debt, which is backed by, I would assume in your case, really the asset is the contracts themselves, these royalty deals, this cash flow that you've got, that those are assets that are worth money. And that in the worst case scenario of a default, that if you were to go bankrupt, that you know there are these assets. And my understanding is that you would, as part of that process, be forced to sell those assets and then bondholders would sort of line up to be able to get back what we call sort of like pennies on the dollar. And it's going to depend on the value of those assets at the time, the amount of debt that you have and where bondholders are in line. So can you help me understand, you know, sort of just that process? I know I feel bad. This is your baby <laughs> and this is yep. your company. Like, I don't want to. But I think it's important for us to kind of go there that, yep. you know, in the worst case scenario, you know, help help people understand uh, what, you know, what they would expect to happen. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Uh, we currently don't have any uns or any secured debt, so uh, bondholders uh, being sort of first ranking secured, so they are at the very front of the line in case of anything uh, bad that could happen to the company. Uh, the other uh, interest, the other thing I also want to point out is really the quality of the cash flow. Uh, as I previously mentioned, you know, ultimately the royalties that we do receive as a company are paid by entities like EC Hydro, uh, uh, Hydro One, uh, Nova Scotia Power, uh, in our um, investments in Europe, it's actually the European Union. So those are actually the, um, the folks that actually write the checks. Right. Uh, you know, uh, so if something goes wrong, those are very high quality. So very difficult to even get pennies on the dollar. You, you know, I would say you'd probably get the full dollar in, in with that respect. Um, Amazing. With respect to with respect to the security, um, what we are, you know, being senior secured. And one interesting fact about senior secured bonds is that really only roughly about four or 5% of bond offerings are actually senior secured. Uh, about 60% are unsecured. 
and the rest are, you know, I would say asset backed. So what is the difference between senior secured, asset backed, unsecured? Uh, unsecured is like your credit card. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, if you don't pay, you get harassing phone calls, uh, you know, but they can't come in and take your assets, your cars and uh, your house. Uh, so, you know, again, it's a promise to pay, but you know, they, they don't have any security. Uh, with asset back, which is a higher level of security, uh, it's more similar to a car loan. So if you don't pay your car loans, um, someone comes in and takes your car, but you still have your house, you still have your investments. Uh, senior security is at the very top. If you don't pay, someone's going to come in, take your house, your loan, uh, your investments. Um, uh, so you can see that the level uh, that we're offering to the green bond investors uh, is of that level. So it is, um, you know, what I would say it's really more of a premium uh, type of, sec of um, uh, security level vis-a-vis uh, -vis some of the other types of Fantastic. No, I think that's is really important for people to understand. And, you know, I can really tell that you've structured this in a way that, that you know, tries to treat investors fairly, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, so I do want to encourage if people do have specific questions, I think we've covered a lot of the broad things, a lot of what people are going to want to know. But if there are questions that you've got, put them in the chat, you know, from the general to the nitty gritty. There's no such thing as a dumb question here. So please, please, please add them. Um, but you know what, what I'll sort of end with Bernard is a question that you actually wanted me to ask you. So, you know, if you're going to do that, which is really like, what keeps you up at night? Like, and as investors in this, obviously we're not going to put more, uh, uh, money in than we are prepared to lose. Um, mm -hmm. that said, you know, I think whatever is keeping you up at night is probably also going to keep <laughs> you, be keeping investors up at night. Yeah. So, you know, what, what are those, uh, uh ghoulish nightmares you have? Well, usually the, 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 the things that keep me up at night are usually my kids. <laughs> uh, but in terms of the, the actual business itself and, you know, really uh, as an investor, uh, I always ask, what is the biggest risk? What's, you know, what is one thing that can happen that will uh, risk losing my investment? And I would say in terms of our business, uh, for our e-royalties, uh, we actually have a very small team. Uh, you know, if you go to our website, you can see our basically full company. Uh, so we, we do have some concentration uh, risk when it comes to human capital. Uh, we always joke that, you know, we don't take the same plane, we don't take the same elevator because, you know, we don't cross the street together. Uh, as a way of risk mitigation. Uh, I think one of the fortunate things, if there's any, anything actually even fortunate about COVID is that we don't do any of that stuff anymore, um, having sort of all working remotely. Uh, but one of the things uh, that's important to know as well is that should that risk ever uh, materialize uh, in the sense that, you know, something uh, unforeseen happens to the entire team, uh, the royalties and the loans that we make uh, will continue to pay. So even without management there, uh, those royalties, the interest payments that we have uh, put together uh, will continue to pay uh, irrespective of management's involvement. So it's a nice protection mechanism again as well that, you know, should something unforeseen happen, um, you know, the, those, that cash flow will continue to uh, flow to our investors, our shareholders, and also our bondholders. Um, you know, to, put it most, to put it more most succinctly, I think one of our uh, shareholders, uh, you know, put it, describe our business really at, when it comes down to it, you know, it's a little bit cheesy, but, you know, uh, I've used it. It's, you know, um, <laughs> whether, uh, you know, the, as long as the sun shines, the wind blows or the water flows, you know, those royalties will continue to pay. The cash is going to flow too. I like that. So, um, okay, great. Did get a question from Michael here. This is probably the type of question you want to hear. Uh, is the bond offering to open right now? And how do you buy your first one? I.e. where to actually click. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, on our website, uh, there's a, um, uh, there's a, I think, uh, an area where you can provide your contacts. Uh, please provide us, uh, you know, and then again, our team, uh, whether it's our uh, investment uh, banking team or 
uh, the investment bankers that we've, we're currently working with or our uh, internal sort of team uh, will reach out uh, to sort of assist you through that process. Beautiful. So I'm looking forward. The first time I went to it, I'm on the site. There's a get in touch here at the bottom. So I'm sure that's yeah. always... Uh, Michael, what you can do there. Um, the first time I did go, it did pop up. There was a little pop up that said specifically the the green bond, and you know I imagine took me through there. But really, what I think the answer here is to to kind of get in touch. That you know it, it is uh, uh, there that you're sort of happy to assist people that do want to do this. That that process is going to vary platform by platform depending on sort of where you're at. So it sounds like people really j should just sort of get in touch and then uh, be able to get the assistance that they need. Um, awesome, well, like, thank you so much for joining me. This was super cool, really excited to learn about this. Um, you know, I think that, that this does provide a, a really cool option for people um, that do want to have, you know, a sliver of their pie chart for what I call doing more good with their bonds. Uh, we're always hungry for more of these impact investments. So, you know, as impact investments uh, become available here in Canada, I do want to be able to uh, uh, provide these little reviews. And, you know, thank you so much for making yourself available. The fact that, you know, we were able to ask you questions directly, uh, I think is really, really cool. Um, yeah. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for having me on, Tim. I really appreciate uh, the time that yourself and your audience uh, took today. And uh, yeah, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to me uh, should anyone have any questions. Fantastic. You have a wonderful day. All the best. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, so that was uh, Bernard Tan, uh, CEO of RE Royalties. Uh, they've got this green bond that's available right now. Uh, obviously, do your due diligence, you know, make sure this is right for you. Uh, don't put all of your money into something like this. This would only be a sliver. But for people that are looking for those impact bonds, I think this is a really cool option. Uh, if you've watched this far, then, you know, do me a favor, like the video with my dog here, uh, like the video, uh, subscribe. You can ring the bell to get notifications. Uh, if you've got more questions, throw them in the comments section. Uh, I've got uh, uh, contact with Bernard, so I can always send him questions if, if you weren't able to watch this live. But if you do have questions for him, um, really, I, I think that the more questions we get, the better. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, hopefully everyone is having a great week and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a great day.